Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. All right, let's get to the news. Uh, we are all sick of this fucking pandemic, uh, which we are still dealing with thanks to the incredibly contagious Delta variant and the fact that about 51% of the country is still unvaccinated. Uh, that's a population that's seeing well over 90% of the new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that have come from this latest surge. Uh, two Biden administration officials told The Washington Post over the weekend that the White House is, quote, growing increasingly anxious about the state of the pandemic and are gravely concerned about the situation spiraling out of control in some areas of the country with low vaccination rates. Uh, the country seems to agree. A new ABC News Ipsos poll found that only 45 percent of Americans are optimistic about the direction of the country. That's a 20 point drop since their poll in May. Uh, other polls show that this increased pessimism is driven almost entirely by the view that was articulated <clears throat> by the view that was articulated by Dr. Fauci on CNN over the weekend. Uh, he said that when it comes to the pandemic, quote, we're going in the wrong direction and quote, it's not going to be good. Um, Jen Psaki got a question about this that was very annoying at the briefing just now. Uh, let's play a clip. Dr. Fauci says we're going in the wrong direction. Whose fault is that? Well, I would say first what he was referring to is the fact that because there is still a large population of people in this country who are unvaccinated and we have the most transmissible variant that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, that more people are getting sick with COVID. And that's not, those numbers are not moving in the right direction. I think that's accurate and you can see it by data. Peter Ducey wants to know whose fault it is. That's what Peter Ducey wants to know. Um, so Fauci in that CNN interview, of course, went on to repeat the Biden administration line that this is now a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Is that how you guys would characterize the situation right now? Because we're all vaccinated um, and uh, these few last last few weeks still feel like we're all in this bullshit together. even though We're all vaccinated. I don't make it a habit to uh, disagree with the scientific consensus <laughs> about how to describe the pandemic. Um, I do think that like. The, the Steve Ducey question is very, very stupid, um, uh, in, but it actually, I think, captures the larger way in which even more sophisticated outlets have been trying to cover the surge. You remember when, when we did the correspondence dinner uh, for uh, President Obama in like 2011 or 2012, we did those fake political headlines. So not the time that we've caused Trump to run for office, the other one? One of the other ones. <laughs> one of the other less notable ones. Gotcha. Uh, but we did these fake political headlines, and one of them was oh, like, yeah. you know, Lincoln Lincoln wins Civil War, where's the bounce? <laughs> and a lot of the headlines, I ha have that feeling. Like, we were talking about a deeply serious situation. All the reporters understand that, like, unlike the previous administration, this is an administration, like, really grappling with the, the absolute best, in trying to, is an administration really grappling with, like, trying to make the best decisions possible with the information they have and the limits of the media and the struggle against uh, vaccine hesitance and all that. And instead the coverage is like, basically whose fault is this and how, how what will be the, what, what will the political implications be? Right. Before you ever have the conversation, like the question whose fault is it is obviously a third question that would probably come after what can we do <laughs> to yeah. change this situation, which no one seems to view as their job to ask. First of all, Fake news, bros. Peter Ducey was what the man who asked the question. I said Peter Ducey. Steve? I didn't say Steve. Did I, I may have said Steve Ducey. Uh, one of, and then, one there's of an, and there's another Ducey in Arizona who's, I think, unrelated. Yeah, there's We're going to get to Ducey's. him later. Yeah. yeah, we got a lot of Ducey's on this <laughs> yeah. show. I just wanted to throw it Ducey's out there. Ducey's wild. You know? Peter Ducey got the job not at all because of his father, Steve Ducey. Ducey's who hosts wild. Fox and Friends. <laughs> Ironically, Steve Ducey's been pretty good on this. He's part of a, a, a get vaccinated PSA that Fox News put out. He's like the good part huh. of Fox Gold star for Steve on Ducey. This one. Gold hey. star. How do you mean? Broken Ducey's right twice a day. <laughs> you know it, what I mean? Love it makes the point about political implications being secondary, which I do agree with. I mean, like, I have found throughout the course of the pandemic that as you sort through terrifying tweets, headlines, news segments about this, it's sort of hard to separate what is real from what is sensationalized obviously there's been a lot of coverage of breakthrough cases do you think that's been too much too little like how have, how do you feel about this stage of the fan, this pandemic right now here are facts 51,000 new cases yesterday nearly 52,000 269 deaths uh those are preventable if 
than the majority of those people were vaccinated. There's reports of some hospital systems being overwhelmed. There's going to be an economic impact. And then, I don't know about you guys, but my old friend, Anxiety, has come back for a visit and has decided to stay for a little while. <sighs> so, like, the oh. reality is there's this is a problem. It's a growing problem. We're really lucky that the Delta variant hit us when it did and not earlier before we were vaccinated. I, I, have I do <laughs> think this is a problem. The political implications, I think, you have to separate out even more. But I think, you know, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. I have this um, way of getting rid of my anxiety house guests. It's a, it's a bouncer. It's an edible. I'm talking about edibles. So I don't know. Uh, the uh, <laughs> we knew we were going. <laughs> what I was, I also, which actually confer an immunity boost. Is that real? No, that's not real. Damn. That's not real. Uh, here's a, here's yeah. I would say two things. One, I think you're right, and like the truth is, Delta is different. Like Andy Slavitt has done really good coverage of this. The ways in which it is actually different, and the ways it shouldn't feel or or actually be covered as being different. And there is there are genuine ways in which Delta is more uh, transmissible, transmissible and is causing more breakthrough infections. That said, one, you see a lot of like doom bait, which is not coverage of what is happening, but and not even quotes of scientists who have fears about what could happen, but summary sentences inside of news coverage that suggests that there's more and terrible things ahead. Like, uh, could there be long COVID? Some scientists fear that could be the case. Yeah, it, it's, it is important to say that, like, some questions people have had about this. If you get a breakthrough infection, um, can you pass it on then to someone else who's vaccinated if you were vaccinated too? The science is still out on that. They think you are less likely to be able to pass it on as you were if you weren't vaccinated, but probably a little more likely than with the alpha variant. But the science is out on that. Could you get long COVID if you're vaccinated and have a breakthrough infection? We do not know. We don't have enough science yet. There have been almost no cases of that detected so far, but it's early. But again, no science on that yet. <laughs> and then the second the second piece of this that I think is influencing all of this coverage is the cohort of people discussing this on Twitter, writing about this, covering it, are vaccinated. And so they are concerned about, and their families are vaccinated for the most part. They are also, they are in the kind of, you know, liberal enclaves that have more, uh, that have um, um, have a greater degree of vaccination. And so they are covering what what about breakthrough infections? What's the situation with breakthrough infections? I'm not saying that that's not important. Of course, it is important. But the the larger story is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, which is, of course, true. But the scale of the coverage isn't matching up because the people writing and reading these stories are all just concerned about their their the impact on them and their families as vaccinated people. I think that this and kids scale, without vaccinated, like, I, I think yeah. the scale of the coverage is appropriate. I think that there's a lack of specificity and there is like a fear first lead, yeah. which is leading to huge swaths of unvac um, unvaccinated people thinking that the vaccine doesn't work against the variants, which is giving them another totally. reason not to get vaccinated as opposed to the last nudge they needed. And I think that's really damaging. I mean, period, look, the key thing that everyone needs to know is that vaccinated people are almost guaranteed not to go to the hospital, not to die. That's the key. That's what vaccines are for. That That's why we are where we are now and not where India was a couple months ago when we first learned about the Delta variant. I think, I think the... The key piece of advice is to when you hear these stories, because you're like almost guaranteed, will some vaccinated people end up in the hospital? Some. Yes. Will we hear about that? Absolutely. Because those are going to be the big stories. And so you, you really do have to look at the numbers and the math overall, like even a really, really effective vaccine, which we have. Once you have a ton of people who are vaccinated, once you get up to 150 million people and you have a vaccine that's anywhere from 80 to 90 percent effective, that's still going to be a lot of fucking people who have breakthrough infections. And again, you're going to hear about it. And we're probably going to hear about it even more because of what you said, Love It, which is what we're all in that same bubble together. Yeah. And it's interesting because I do think there is this there has been this rise of kind of coverage around breakthrough infections, what to be afraid of, what not. It hasn't been specific enough. It has made a lot of people afraid. My text messages suggest that that fear is spreading. Um, but at the same time, I actually think the more important shift we've seen over the last two weeks is uh, like, you know, Rupert Murdoch from his yacht gave some kind of a fucking diktat mm -hmm. and it came down to like be more pro vaccine on all of his channels. And you see a big uptick. And I think yeah, the, the actual coverage of the Delta surge has combined to mean that we've seen a rise in 
in vaccinations. I think the, I think the greatest increase in the rise of vaccinations, or, or the, the thing most responsible for the increase, is the Delta variant R- itself. Yeah, Ron Klein, sure. the White House chief of staff, tweeted this yesterday. I think 760,000 people got vaccinated in a 24-hour period, which you have to think is due to this round of reporting. Biggest number since early June. Yep. Like they haven't yep. been there in a while. Yep. So that, that is some good news. What more can the Biden administration do to get the Delta surge under control? What tools do they have in the toolbox? So here's where I think, again, precision is helpful. I think there are things that Biden can do and then there are demands that Biden say things. And one is effective and one is useless, yeah. right? So uh, if we lived in a rational world, Biden could announce a vaccine mandate, a two to three week mask mandate, and we would crush the Delta variant in its tracks. But we live in a stupid, broken, polarized country where one political party acts like that would be an act of oppression. Trying to save your life is an act of oppression. They wouldn't follow through, so it gets complicated. I think where you start to hear people saying, Biden should go out and say more, give speeches, do fireside chats. That's where it's actually counterproductive. So yesterday, Politico quoted a historian saying, we'll look back on this period and say, Biden should have been doing regular addresses to the American people. What a missed opportunity. And I just think that's a dated view of the country, of how communication works. Because like you were saying earlier, I love it, like Sean Hannity talking up the vaccine, Steve Scalise getting vaccinated, Republican radio hosts who had a change of heart. Like those are the messengers we need to reach this big group of people that are unvaccinated and Republican and don't believe that Biden's actually the president of the United States, right? <laughs> I mean, like, that's how fundamental the mistrust is. The Republican governor of Alabama said, you're letting us down if you don't get vaccinated. I think those are things, those are the messengers that we should be elevating and trying to get covered right now. Like, you know, John, you've, I, I think the, the things that Biden, we would like Biden to do, I think are probably more likely to happen on a local level. Like you've been talking up the need for L.A. to say, hey, if you work for the city, get vaccinated. Yeah, no, New York announced today that New York City workers are going to be required to be vaccinated. Uh, San Francisco has. L.A., of course, has not, even though they were first out of the gate on the on reinstating the mask mandate, which tells you everything you need to know about what it's like to live in L.A. during the pandemic this whole time. <laughs> um, but look, I, so what can Biden do in terms of vaccine requirements? I like calling them requirements now. I like that. Um, okay, yeah, no, 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 man, no, no M word. Uh, so in terms of vaccine requirements, he could require... Um, you know, vaccine requirements for all federal tr- for all travel, right? Because that's under the federal peer view for purview for uh, air travel or mm-hmm. train travel. Um, he could also require for uh, vaccine requirements for walking into a federal building. Uh, he could do that soon. The other big thing, love it. I know you're gonna have something to say about this. Is a lot of vaccine requirements either on the uh, local, state, or federal level, or in the private sector, would be on even firmer legal ground. Many of them are on firm legal ground already, but they would be on even firmer legal ground if the FDA finally approved, fully approved the vaccine, even though the FDA and the leaders of the FDA have been telling us for months, it is absolutely safe it's approved <laughs> as an emergency use authorization. Hey, look, obviously, look, the most important thing um, in uh, what makes people trust a process is knowing that like some fucking arcane procedure was was followed, even <laughs> despite all common sense and knowledge. And actually, we, we really want is the FDA to treat literally, what are we at now? two billion human beings as guinea pigs for their trial. That's like the most important thing, because what are the two fucking options for the FDA at this point? The, do they really think that like not approving it now and approving it in a month or two months or three months or whenever they get around to it is going to improve trust in their process? And then the alternative is that there's some concept like imagine what happens if they come to the conclusion it isn't safe. Yeah, right. Like, wow, you know what? <laughs> big whoopsie there. Thank you, FDA. Yeah, we, we are so s- proud of you. We have like, made a big mistake that uh, only- 150 million <laughs> Americans have now made with us. Look Sorry. Good. We just told you to do it. We told you to take it. Don't yell at us. And like, and like the more putting like, it's very silly, but like, it's this very it's this idea that like the reason the FDA is the gold standard and is trusted is because they follow their processes without exception. And, and actually it's like, the, the 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 reason you trust the FDA is because you trust that the processes are smart and built to get a good result. We already have the result. Like common sense should kind of apply here. Like the it, it is so stupid and counterproductive that they haven't just approved this fucking like most of the country has taken the vaccine. You work for us. You're our health representatives. We've already done it. We trusted you. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, the CDC, the FDA, they've taken a bit of a hit when it comes to trust in those institutions. That's why when I hear about things like the NFL saying, you know what, if you're a member of an NFL team and you don't get vaccinated and you have to uh, cancel a game because a bunch of people get sick, you forfeit that game and you forfeit your pay. That kind of shit is going to make people pay attention. Or when campuses are like, guess what? You want to go to 
let's say Duke, whatever, some school, you can't come back on campus until you're vaccinated. I think that at scale is going to be highly effective. So this is my one more big thing that the Biden administration could be doing is to more fully and forcefully get behind those moves that you're describing. So like someone asked Jen about this at the briefing about the NFL and she's like, yeah, that's their right to do and they can do that stuff like that. And they're sort of tiptoeing around this because I know that they're worried about the politics of vaccine requirements. And, you know, they're probably looking at France and Italy, where now they have vaccine requirements and there were like massive protests in the street. I'm sure the Biden administration doesn't want to see that here. But like you have the NFL doing this. You have college campuses doing this now. You have health systems doing this. You have businesses doing this. Crooked media. We say you can't come back into the office unless you're vaccinated. Like the, the, the Biden administration could be leading a national effort to really encourage businesses all over the country to put in place vaccine requirements. I can't believe Lewis was like, I don't want that 5G in my fucking body. I won't see you again. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But Lewis. no, I actually not sure. I, see, that that's I disagree. Right. I, think, I don't agree there. I, I, I want to go back to the Obama up. era theory of leading from behind. I'd like to see them like poke and prod people quietly to announce these things and then do exactly what Jen did and shut up about it and not yeah. make it about Joe Biden and make it about Roger Goodell's overpaid, obnoxious, lying ass, making a bunch of NFL players. If, look, if they're, if putting, they're, pre- if they're putting pressure on them in behind the scenes, I, I think that's probably fine too, but they should be putting pressure on them because these are, remember, we're not trying to, this isn't about convincing vaccine skeptics. This is about convincing the business community who is probably all vaccinated and the leaders of the business community are probably much more pro-Biden and willing to listen to the White House than a lot of the people who won't get the vaccine. Again, there's, I think there are two tracks here. There is a persuasion track that, can, that should continue to go on where people you know, try to persuade vaccine skeptical, vaccine hesitant people to take the shot. I don't want to classify them all as like MAGA lunatics, right? There's a lot of really good people who just are worried about it and haven't taken it. So you got to persuade them. Then there's another track that is a vaccine requirement track that a lot of countries are experimenting, that a lot of businesses are experimenting with here too. And I think we have to expand that as quickly as possible. And the Biden administration should do whatever they can to get behind that. Yeah, but I don't think Joe Biden getting up there and saying, I'm in favor of vaccine requirements is going to mean we end up with more vaccine requirements. For the exact same reason, he's not necessarily the right messenger to tell people to get vaccinated at this point. And it's more important to lift up local voices and people and and, and vaccine skeptics that people that the vaccine skeptics might trust like the, the, but this the is already, is already out there they're already out there on this they, i like, know it's d- just d- d- fauci's on tv saying yeah there should be more local mandates there should be more of this so like they're they this is what i'm saying it's not like they've yeah. been i don't want to talk about it they're already a little bit out there so I, I just look when the nfl announces this step i want a bunch of businesses to read about the nfl doing this i don't want them to read a subsequent story that gets topped with a jen Psaki or joe biden comment about how yeah they should do this and everyone should be doing this it's like i want to let that story marinate out there people read it and try to follow suit but like look it, it's a matter of degree here. Yeah, I just think it's this is not a persuasion thing to me. This is not about the coverage. The vaccine requirements got to get done and they got to get done fast because by the time we, if we're putting them in place in December after everyone's decided they like what the NFL done and they put in place, it's too fucking late and a bunch of people have died. So like as fast as we can, we got to put them in place. If they're doing it behind the scenes, that's fine, but they got to do it. Um, at some point, Biden's message about the pandemic and his governing record will sharpen into a campaign message for the midterms. Uh, we got a preview of that on Friday in Virginia when the president campaigned for the first time with former Governor Terry McAuliffe in his race against Republican Glenn Youngkin. Biden focused on his work to end the pandemic and save the economy, but he also called Youngkin an acolyte of Donald Trump and said, quote, I ran against Donald Trump and so is Terry. I whipped Donald Trump in Virginia and so will Terry. Uh, this is interesting because Tommy and I recorded our interview with uh, with Congressman Schiff uh, before we started talking about this. He basically said, if Kevin McCarthy is speaker, if the Republicans win the House, it'll be like Donald Trump is speaker. What do you guys think about this clear strategy on behalf of Democrats now to tie all of these Republican candidates to Donald Trump? You see the same thing in uh, in California. There are ads running nonstop saying "Stop the Stop the Trumpist recall of Gavin Newsom." Oh, really? I haven't yeah, seen that. they were on last night. Yeah, like first, they, and it's you know, first they tried to overturn the election. Now the insurrectionists have set their eyes on California yes. and Gavin Newsom. So I, I mean, I, I, I don't like, think. Like, what do you think? Did I was like, I was like, I, look, I don't. I was like, okay, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Like, yeah, sure, why not? Let's go for it. It's a Trump thing. I'm sure. I'm sure. sure I'm sure it's polling well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just um, uh, Donald Trump is not popular in a changing Virginia and tying Republic, you know, political the way in which Donald Trump has been covered 
has never treated him like a normal politician. But as a normal politician, Donald Trump is a deeply unpopular, divisive figure that turns off a lot of people, especially the kind of people a Republican needs to bring back if they are going to win in a state like Virginia. In the suburbs, the places where Trump has lost and the places where some of those Republicans could come home to a more moderate or kind of less a less uncivil figure. And I think they're trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. What, what's interesting about that Biden message is essentially the MAGA message, because I was watching uh, the Turning Point USA event that became this by the Trump Arizona speech. Yeah. And that little schlub, uh, Charlie Kirk, who runs the organization, said, if you were silent about what happened in 2020, get out of the party and run as a Democrat. So these members are going to get squeezed on both sides and essentially get forced into taking this position. And you know, it's probably a state by state thing in terms of how it polls and what it'll mean for Terry McAuliffe versus someone in running in Arkansas or whatever, but it's interesting. It, look, hey, it's a strategy. I, I, like uh, that. I haven't seen this anywhere, though I'm sure it is everywhere and I've just missed it, but like calling him uh, Glenn Trumpkin is just like right there for the taking. I mean, I, that seems like a that seems like it's in a fucking yeah. Democratic fundraising email right now. I'm not yeah, saying it's it, a good idea, but I'm going to say it's probably going to happen. If yeah, it's I'd not, right. it, it, you just did it. I just did it. What I'm, what I'm worried about is like... I, I don't want it to be too simplistic. Like I, I could tell Lovett that's sort of what you might have been chafing at with yeah. the ad. Like I don't I think one of the one thing that we didn't do as much in 2020 is link all of the other like we didn't define the Republican Party and the threat from the Republican Party. What we said is Trump is the biggest threat to democracy right now and so Joe Biden needs to be Donald Trump. That was the right thing to do in 2020 because Trump was a fucking existential threat to democracy. Well, all these months later, as all the Republicans have sided with Trump on the uh, you know insurrection and uh, potential uh, potential coup there, um, I do think that in 2022 we need to have a message about the Republican Party and it's not just what does it mean to be like Trump? What does it mean to be a Republican Party that has remade itself? in Trump's image. It's like a very subtle difference, but I think you need to describe Republicans and what's wrong with them and what's bad about them that's not just, oh, they're all Trump. And I, and I do think like one of the challenges, and I think you see this with like, I think it's one of the debates that kind of plays out over and over again in terms of democratic messaging is there's an impulse on the part of, of, of democratic campaigns to focus on kind of kitchen table issues because those poll really well for Democrats. They pull really poorly for Republicans. Then you have, I think, another argument that's also valid, which is like we can't simply ignore the assault on democracy, even though there is this like kind of surface level polling that tells us it's not the place to fight. And so I do think one of the challenges like we think Donald Trump, one of the moments of his lowest popularity after four years of fucking misrule was when he was trying to overturn Obamacare. That was just true, right? And like painting Republicans not just as Trumpist uh, because we don't like him personally, but because we don't like his, you know, pro, you know, low tax rates for corporations, uh, cuts to social services. Like we have to figure out a way to make this a message that ties the anti democratic and the kind of incivility that people hate uh, to the the policy agenda that that's harder to kind of get the media to focus on, certainly. Yeah, by saying that they're all like Trump, you're calling them extremists, and I think that there's a way to define what a Republican extremist means today, and that can range anywhere from voting against COVID relief checks, which they did, to voting against a bipartisan panel to investigate an attack on the Capitol, right? They're all sort of a, of a piece. But again, like, tr Trump is at the terms of the debate here because he said at this speech we're about to talk about that the election lied, you know, him feeling the election was stolen from him is the biggest issue there is. I think that's a direct quote. He says it's bigger than the border, it's bigger than inflation, it's bigger than anything else. To him, this is the core issue that Republicans should be talking about. So they'll probably get there. So we should meet them there. Not just and not just should be talking about, have to be talking about or unless you're out. unless yeah, or you're out unless yeah. you want to be punished. Yeah. All right. So the front runner for the twenty twenty four Republican nomination took the stage at a rally for election integrity, is what it was called, in Arizona on Saturday. Uh, Donald Trump spoke for nearly two hours and he played all the hits. He even led a locker up chant about Hillary Clinton for old time's sake. Uh, since no one but the Newsmax audience had the pleasure of watching the speech in full, and since no one should ever have to watch another Trump speech in full, we thought we'd bring you the top five batshit craziest moments from Trump's Arizona speech. Uh, let's hear number five. How about the vaccine? I came up with the vaccine. They said it would take three to five years, gonna save the world. I recommend you take it, but I also believe in your freedoms 100%. But just so you understand. <laughs> It was a, it was a sandwich there. Yeah, I'm awesome. Look what I did. Oh, you don't have to take it if you don't want, but it's awesome that I did it. <laughs> I recommend you take it. I recommend you take it, but like, clear, does not want that clip alone. 
doesn't want it out there alone. <sighs> That's why I get so frustrated when you, you wake up in the morning and Politico Playbook says, why isn't Joe Biden giving more speeches about this? Because it's just so clear that that's not going to be effective. That's not the problem. Joe Biden is not the solution here. It's Donald Trump both sides seeing the vaccine in the middle of a, a massive new surge. It's just, like I'm not defending Biden. I'm not saying the, no, the so response has been perfect. But it's like if Trump came out and said, hey, you're all going to die if you don't get this vaccine. Get it tomorrow. If you want to be a part of, of my movement, do it. if you want to be part of this movement, there's one thing you need to do first. Which we need to get this vaccine. We need you safe. We need you healthy. We need you voting. Get the vaccine. Yeah. No. So this is I, I'm 100 percent with you on this one. This so is slightly different than my Biden should be pushing vaccine. No, but this requirements is, again, this is about what Biden should say, not do. Right. right. And, and on the saying, like Chris Christie was actually saying this over the weekend. He talked. He's like, I talked to some guy and, you know, convinced him to get the vaccine. And what he doesn't want here is like Joe Biden going out there every day and tweeting and Kamala Harris tweeting like, get vaccinated isn't doing anything and he's right <laughs> like at this point the white house going out and just being like get vaccinated is not a, you know it's, it's a message in the messenger it's going to happen locally it's going to happen in communities it's going to happen from trusted sources like doctors or people you know or people in your family um, that's how you're going to get people vaccinated and clearly donald trump does not want to be part of that effort even though he was vaccinated among he's one among one of the first people vaccinated and did so in secret and wants credit for it and wants credit for it um all right let's listen to number four I said, why wouldn't this governor, Doug Ducey, you know, when I did rallies, when I did rallies, he always wanted to be in the front row. Sir, could you mention my name, please? Or yeah, I'll mention. But I'd introduce him, and I wouldn't get much of an applause, and I'd get a lot of booze. And I kept saying, you know, this guy's not very popular. But now, you know what? He's not popular with me either. They came to see me. They said, sir, would you like him to run for the Senate? I said, he's not getting my endorsement, I can tell you. The Mitch, the Mitch McConnell, there's another beauty, by the way, the Mitch McConnell Republican, the Mitch McConnell, the old crow. <laughs> what did that mean? Crow. Where did the old crow the come old from? The old crow. The old crow. It's definitely not the most important part of that clip, but I just could not stop laughing at the old crow, Mitch McConnell. That old crow. Uh, is that a thing? Is that, that a saying? Old crow. So for some reason, I also watched uh, Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar's oh. speech. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a Republican congressman from the 4th District. So you know that scene in Men in Black when the alien first comes down? Mm -hmm. And he takes over the body of the mechanic. Yeah, he's Vincent got that sort of like weird affect yeah. where like he kind of like lurches oh, right. around. Yeah, Vincent D'Onofrio. That's one, Paul one Gosar. Of his, one of his great performances. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of his good. You and really think that he's wearing a Vincent D'Onofrio suit? Yeah, that's the cool thing about it. And so he's talking like there the, the the number of theories that they're going through to get to this audit. Like they think four hundred to seven hundred thousand ballots were altered. He's recommending a documentary called Kill Chain, which is either a documentary or a 2019 Nick Cage movie. But there's I, what I'm trying to get at is, slowly, is that there's really no difference between this Gosar speech and where Trump is on the audit and on what's happening in, in Arizona in terms of the election lie. And the Paul Gosar speech is like one of the craziest things I've ever watched. See, my thought hearing that is, without a doubt, Doug Ducey is the presents like the greatest threat to you know mark kelly or kirsten, yeah. or kirsten cinema in arizona because he is one of the few sort of let's call them establishment republicans sure. left in arizona the arizona republican party is well known for all the rest of its fucking kooks right from kelly ward to uh joe arpaio and the rest mm -hmm. of the crew and i it made me think like you know, we've been sort of worried that, you know, that Donald Trump is going to remake the party in his image and endorse all these Trumpy candidates who are going to, like, wreak havoc. And, and I, I still worry a great deal about that. But, like, the fact that he's going to go all in against Ducey when Ducey is clearly their best candidate there uh, is very telling. And you wonder how many different places around the country um, that will happen. Well, yeah, I mean, look, the only time the Republican Party and Donald Trump's interests have 100 percent aligned is when Donald Trump was on the ballot because Donald Trump wants right. to win and they want him to win. Right. But. Uh, you know, I think we will see a mix of Trumpian politics driving turnout of that base combined with some of the kind of blowback we saw in Georgia with Donald Trump sowing chaos because he sees it in his interest to be a kingmaker or um, what's it called when you throw a king out the window? Def Defenestration? Defenestration is throwing someone out of a window. What's it called when you kill a king? Oh, uh, something side. Reaside. Reaside. Nice. Anyway, he's going to kill kings. Yeah. yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's just so Slayer. jarring. 
Whatever. Here, Gosar talk about his like who killed Ashley Babbitt bracelet, and it's and terrifying. he's and he's a, it's again suggesting that insiders from the FBI and DOJ were part of the insurrection. It's like that guy was what one or two speakers before Trump. I mean, it, it, that's the party. Now, the one place where Trump really is smart on the politics is bashing McConnell. Again, I keep thinking yep. about that unite the country memo that the pro Biden super PAC, and mm-hmm. they said the the one politician that even the strongest Biden voters and the strongest Trump voters all hated was Mitch McConnell. It was like it was like the one thing every f- person in the focus group and all the focus groups <laughs> agreed on was that Mitch McConnell was garbage. So running against Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell in 2022, again, seems like a smart move. Um, all right, let's listen to number three. And I only wish that my friend Mike Pence had that additional courage to send to send the results back to the legislatures. Not for nothing. It's amazing to me that Trump still thinks that Mike Pence had the power to send the results back to the legislatures. So that, like, it should be obvious. So there was a story in Politico over the weekend that Pence is all but gone from the ticket if Trump runs again, and that they're viewing everyone who is considering running in 2024 as a potential running mate. And it was interesting to read that because you don't often read about a, a former vice president being jettisoned from a ticket, especially not a successful ticket. But then to hear that, riff over and over and over again like of course he's gone of course he's dead be. in the water he's just gone but it's funny that pence still thinks he has a chance and is is hitting the like chicken dinner circuit going to all these iowa dinners and stuff and thinks he's like yeah look i mean that's real that's real optimism uh, a crowd of angry maga supporters were uh want, chanting for you to be hung and uh and then you still you still think you have a chance with them that's that's it's, optimism it's um it's um yeah hey mike if you're uh if <laughs> If your date tries to hang you, that's a deal breaker. You know what I mean? Like they don't want you. They wanted to, they wanted to kill you. As they they wanted to say, kill you. The old saying. The people you're campaigning to win the votes of wanted to kill you. Tommy, to your point about the piece about Pence getting Jenison from the ticket, mm-hmm. it, it really all of the contenders right now that are that are potentially running in 2024 are acting more like they are doing an audition for Trump's VP than they are candidates right mm-hmm. now. Whether it's Christy Nome, whether it's DeSantis, uh, any of them, all they're doing <clears throat> is sucking up to Trump as much as possible. They don't seem like candidates who are running to win. They seem like candidates mm-hmm. who are running to be Donald Trump's it's vice 2016 president. 2016 dynamic all over again. Yeah, yeah. It's, no, it's the Jeb, it's the Jeb, dilemma. It's the Jeb Bush uh, yeah, there. Nome is Nome is basically bashing the other Republicans too, trying to yeah. say like these people tried to save their states from COVID, not me. <laughs> not this one. That's why I should be vice president. Well, she also wants, and and she probably also wants Trump to view DeSantis as a threat, so that of course Trump picks her. Yep. You know? Well, and also I think they're just they're waiting for the moment Trump decides it's time to um destroy Ron DeSantis to make yeah. a point make a point about what happens if you poke your head up above the trench. Yeah, which is why Ron DeSantis is being super nice and not even obliquely making any contrast with no. Trump. But again, meanwhile, the Washington Post reported over the weekend that Trump's super PAC has raised $75 million this year and none of it has gone toward these audits, these attempts to, you know, overturn the election. So it's all bullshit. Yeah, why fund them when you can just talk about them like they're right. the most important thing ever right. but not actually spend your limited money on them. Yeah. Uh, all right, number two. The U.S. women's soccer team is a very good example of what's going on. Earlier this week, they unexpectedly lost to Sweden, three to nothing. And Americans were happy about it. You proved that point before I even said it. America first. He's got a crowd rooting against America in favor of the socialist Swedes. Well, they're white. The Swedes are white. The Swedes are a white country. He likes that. He always talks about Sweden. Unbelievable. In this section, he said, wokeism makes you lose, ruins your mind, ruins you as a person. Uh, Then he accused the left of ruining baseball because the Cleveland Indians changed their name to the Cleveland Guardians. Then he attacked LeBron James, and he said the ratings went up after his team was defeated. So I guess Donald Trump's point is that the ratings for the NBA Finals were higher than for the first round of the playoffs. That sort of stands to reason. But it was a real real rant, a real anti-athlete, anti-American rant here that is... And was huh. it stark? This Didn't is, it turn anti-trans at one point too? Yeah, that was the LeBron. The LeBron the attack sort of really was quite transgender a, athletes. Quite yeah. a journey. Quite a journey. But it's I a also culture. I also think this is you know Medi and I were talking about this on Thursday's pod, but an example of like 
a culture war the Democrats should not shy away from, right? Like this guy is now against American sports, right? Rooting against American athletes. That's not popular with most of the country. Uh, again, uh, right now, Chiron, the Fox News of the left that doesn't exist for a full week, uh, Republicans turn on America's athletic heroes for a full week, and then it would become a story, and then you'd start seeing it in the polls that they have this anti-patriotism problem. But of course, that won't happen because we have a we're fighting an asymmetric uh, battle here. But yeah. yeah, no, I mean we'll like, run it as a Chiron on here. Yeah, yeah can we, we get it. a Chiron here? Can we get our Fox News of the Fox News of the Left Chiron? <laughs> All right. Terrific. The number the number one most batshit crazy moment from Donald Trump's speech in Arizona. Here it is. The county has, for whatever reason, also refused to produce the network routers. We want the routers, Sonny. Wendy, we got to get those routers, please. The routers. Come on, Kelly, we can get those routers. Those routers, you know what? It, we're so beyond the routers. There's so many fraudulent votes without the routers. If you got those routers, what that will show, and they don't want to give up the routers. They don't want to give them. They are fighting like hell. Why are these commissioners fighting not to give the routers? How simple could it be? That will tell the truth. Do you think he knows what a router is or has ever seen a router? Do you guys know the backstory of what this, where this came from? No, and I didn't intend to learn it, but now I, but okay, you know what? We're here, we'll and I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I'll fight. I found out about the Cleveland Indians changing their name to the Cleveland Guardians from you, so keep oh, going. Cool. <laughs> so, How did you miss that? So, I, I mean, you're not a big sports guy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Maricopa County, right, they're doing this audit. They're trying to subpoena the network routers used by the county's election division because the audit leaders think the voting machines were online, and that's how votes were electronically transferred from Trump to Biden. This is a part of this bigger, impossible-to-follow conspiracy theory that alleges the election theft was orchestrated by someone working in the U.S. Embassy in Rome. So the Italians are Rome? behind this. Uh, and they used Italian Roma. military satellites to change votes from Trump to Biden. And this was apparently orchestrated by Obama, the former prime minister uh, of Italy, Prime Minister Renzi, in the CIA. And it was basically manufactured by some website group entity called Nations in Action. And so the, the so it was an Italian job. It was an Italian job. There you go. By the way, I'm sorry. I just Italian military satellites. What are those? I, I, yeah, right, <laughs> right. I don't know. And so, but what the the people in charge of the elections in Arizona are saying is, hey, if we give you all our routers, it'll cost us six million dollars to replace them. But this is like this is the disinformation problem, right? He just every week spouts something new. It's impossible. What to does he think it. is it's in the? Endless. What does he think is in the routers? He enjoys Evidence Hillary's emails are in the router. <laughs> it's the perfect kind of ballots, word for him. Ballots are stuck in the router. He doesn't know what a router is. He sees it there. He has some fun because it sounds technical. It sounds like something you should try to he get. He knows he won't times. get them. Routers. He knows you don't Wendy, need them. Wendy, get the routers. Because he knows even without the routers, he's still going to make the same argument. It does, like, it, to make a serious point, like, um, uh, this is the new kind of conspiracy theory that is much harder to combat, which is it's conspiracy without the theory. Like, Tommy just outlined one version of the story. There are which I now believe. Of course, it's, they're calling it Italy Gate. Yeah, and uh, like, I'm, I'm in hundreds I'm, of thousands of views on I'm, YouTube. I'm with, invested uh, with but, videos about this. But really, what they're they the want ones who put the microchip in the vaccines also. is to True. say the election mm -hmm. is fraudulent, and then you say the election is fraudulent, and it's a command to all of these people to create a theory from the ground up that can help make that argument. And so you don't need any specific case. Trump doesn't need to latch on any one kind of case. Neither does uh, evil dentist Paul Gosar. And mm -hmm. and what happens is all these people from the ground up generate their own version of the truth. Any one of them uh, is fine on any given day. The same thing happened with Benghazi. Benghazi. We're going to see it over and over again. The same thing happened, I think, with some of the uh, um, conspir conspiracy theories around Hunter Biden. Rudy Giuliani generates these. And this is, and so it's just, it's endless. There's no way to stop right. it because it's 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 from the ground up. It's not from the top down. They're complicated and they're kind of lurid and detailed right now. So the Georgia, remember in Atlanta, there was a water main break. So they had to leave the building and they came back in, whatever. Now he says that water main break on election night was fake that political operatives stuffed a bunch of ballots with fake ballots so that were under a table. He said that people were so upset that they threw up watching it. <laughs> yeah, I thought that. You, you, you know, like, that's pretty vivid Vom scene. You think it would vomiting. be reported out. Yeah. Somehow it has not that the Italians hacked us. But again, like the fringe organization no one's ever heard of, 
YouTube videos are it just comes out of the president of the United States mouth. And again, the, the, there's scary real life consequences here in addition to the fact that this is all barreling towards another Trump run for president. But um, in Georgia today now, because of the new law, the Republican state legislature is moving, taking steps to take over elections in Fulton County. Um, which is the things that we were most worried about with some of these voter restriction bills is the fact that Republicans are just going to try to take over nonpartisan elections or elections where Republicans uh, ran them who are not sufficiently loyal to Donald Trump. I also say, too, like this conspiratorial mindset, like infects every aspect of our culture, including the resistance to the vaccine. And, you know, a lot of people gave uh, Sean Hannity, I think, credit he didn't deserve for how he said how he pointed people toward the vaccine. He said, you know, research it like crazy. Mm -hmm. Talk to your doctor. Many people vaccine is a good option. And then, of course, he comes back and walks back and says, I never recommended the vaccine. I never recommended the vaccine because it, regardless of any one instance of someone saying take it or don't take it, they have built an entire ecosystem that is predicated on the assumption that no one is telling you the truth. Nothing you see is real. You can't believe any public official ever, no matter what they say, unless it's Donald Trump, Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, or Tucker Carlson. And we pay for it in small ways and large ways every single day. They are pro-virus, anti-America. That's it. Yep. There's, the, there's the message. All right. Uh, that's all we have for today. We'll talk to you guys later. We really want to know more about what you think of the show and what we can do to make it better. So we'd love it if you could take a quick survey on crooked.com slash survey shouldn't take too long and as a thank you we'll give you 20 percent off any order at the crooked store i can't believe we got nate silver to run that for us but yeah it's <laughs> or is it nate Cohn? it's uh it's one of the nates please the confidence do the survey is gonna be plus or minus 20 <laughs> percent. please do the survey <laughs> because the less likely you are to do the survey the more we'd like you to do the survey you know what i mean yeah we want to capture all those people Love it once the haters is what he's, he's demanding. Yeah. Your Did you want the scorn. haters? I was going to yeah. say, I was going to say only take it if you have nice things to once say. Once our reviews are my kink. <laughs>